Hi, I'm Ethan Weiner. This is my wife, Ellie, and this is our living room home theater. Howdy. I've been a professional audio engineer for more than 30 years, and my current company, Real Traps, specializes in acoustics and acoustic treatment for recording studios, listening rooms, and home theaters. Our goal today is to explain the basics of setting up a listening room for high-quality sound. Few of us have the luxury of building a dedicated room, so along the way we'll also look at some of the compromises that often must be made. In order to obtain excellent sound, room layout and acoustic treatment are equally important. These are far more important than which electronics you have, and often even more important than your loudspeakers. As you can see, I have mostly modest gear, but the speakers are professional quality, and I have a top-of-the-line subwoofer from SVS. I use this Dell laptop to create surround mixes using a program called Sonar. Indeed, the requirements for home listening rooms and professional mixing and mastering rooms are identical. As flat a response as possible, with a minimum of direct reflections, repetitive echoes, and modal ringing. Even though this room is designed as a home theater with 5.1 surround sound, it serves equally well for two-channel music. Some people believe the requirements are different for each medium, but I promise you this room is fabulous for both. The main goals for excellent sound are having a flat frequency response and controlling reflections at mid and high frequencies and ringing at low frequencies. Excess ambience, reflections, and reverb at higher frequencies tend to make music and speech unclear and irritating to listen to. At low frequencies, peaks and ringing create the effect known as one-note bass, where every bass note sounds more or less the same, regardless of its real pitch. Nulls at bass frequencies are just as damaging as peaks. Having no bass at the listening position, but too much everywhere else, is a very common problem. Mid and high frequencies are easy to tame, but bass frequencies are much more difficult because the wavelengths are longer. However, both high and low frequencies are typically treated with absorption tailored to each range. Most of this room's corners are treated with bass traps. Obviously, the appearance of treatment this extensive is not for everyone. If you have a sufficient budget, you can build false walls or stretch fabric on frames and hide all the panels. Though I happen to think this looks pretty cool. By the way, there are 39 traps in this room. All of the first reflection points are also treated on the side walls, the ceiling, and the floor. If this room had a hardwood floor, I'd put throw rugs at those points. Note that the first reflection treatment on the side walls is proportioned better than typical 2 by 4 foot panels. This shape extends the depth of the listening area. I'll go into more detail about the acoustic treatment in this room later on, but first, let's consider the room layout. For the flattest bass response, the ideal seating position puts the listener's ears 38% of the way back from the front wall. When that's not practical, 38% from the rear wall is a good second choice. But being closer to the front wall is preferred because the inevitable peaks and deep nulls are worse at the rear where the reflections are stronger. When neither distance is possible, at least avoid the center of the room, front to back, because that location always has a severe bass null. You should also avoid being right against the rear wall behind you because comb filtering is always worst there. Comb filtering is a specific type of frequency response error and we'll visit that again in a few moments. If you must be right in front of a wall, that wall should be treated with the thickest absorption you can manage to avoid reflections to as low a frequency as possible. Left-right symmetry is important for good imaging, especially in the front of the room and especially between your ears and the front loudspeakers. Speaker placement should also be symmetrical, both in relation to your ears and to the front and side walls. Ideally, all five speakers will be placed so their tweeters are at ear level. If this isn't possible, at least make all three front speakers the same height and do the same for the rear speakers. Many receivers can play test signals to help you balance the volume levels using an SPL meter. I also use the ETF and R plus D software from Acoustasoft to adjust my subwoofer's level and verify the overall response. If you're not prepared to invest in professional room analysis software and a calibrated microphone, test DVDs can be valuable. I use Digital Video Essentials, and there are others that have similar features that work well with a basic Radio Shack SPL meter. For this particular room, a rear projector TV makes the most sense because of the front windows. Therefore, the center speaker had to be placed a bit lower than ear level to avoid blocking the screen, and in turn, the left and right speakers are also a bit low. 
These particular Mackie HR624 speakers have a very good off-axis response, so being a few inches too low is not much of a problem. These speakers are also very linear. These are active monitors having two power amplifiers and an electronic crossover. They are very flat and also have very low distortion. Mackie also makes a larger model, the HR824, which is well suited for systems that have no subwoofer. Notice my do-it-yourself speaker decouplers made from two inches of 705 rigid fiberglass. The cardboard boxes are used mostly to get the proper height, but boxes like this do a good job decoupling on their own. Speaker decoupling can be useful with floors that vibrate because some of the sound travels through the floor and arrives before the sound in the air. The different arrival times can create comb filtering and skew the frequency response. In this room, it's impossible to have the couch exactly 38% of the way from the rear wall behind because of the opening to the kitchen. Ideally, the couch would be about a foot farther back than it is now. Someday, I hope to install a door there. Then I'll be able to move the couch back a bit and also move the surround speakers back. Also, the light dimmers prevent putting the surround speakers at the ideal height. Note that I have variable transformer dimmers throughout the house to avoid the buzz you often get from solid state dimmers. The goal is to have all five loudspeakers the same distance from your head in an arc. When this is not possible, as in this room, you should set your receiver's distance adjustment controls to reflect whatever distance each speaker really is from your ears. Now let's look at room treatment. The three rules of acoustic treatment are broadband, not tuned, bass traps in as many corners as you can manage, including the wall ceiling corners and even the wall floor corners where possible. Mid and high frequency absorption at the first reflection points on the side walls and ceiling. And some additional amount of mid and high frequency absorption on any large areas of bare parallel surfaces, such as opposing walls or the ceiling if the floor is reflective. As I mentioned earlier, most of the corners in this room have base traps, including the tri-corners where two walls meet the ceiling or the floor. The more base traps you have in a room, the flatter and tighter the low end will be. It really is that simple. Because the ceiling angles upward, which is useful acoustically, the tri-corner traps in the front of this room don't meet the ceiling as they would in a room with a flat ceiling, but I think they look pretty cool anyway. Note the homemade visors that keep direct light from reflecting off the TV screen. It's also worth mentioning that the most important bass frequency range is from around 60 or 80 Hz up to about 300 Hz. This covers most of the fullness and clarity range for bass instruments. People sometimes obsess about being flat to below 20 Hz, but for music anyway, that's less important than above 60 to 80 Hz. Ideally, there would be another bass trap resting on the mantle, but this is the one concession I made for my wife. Even the peaked ceiling is treated with traps. At the time I did the ceiling, my company didn't have a 2x2 foot trap. If I were treating this room today, I'd put 2x2 foot traps in the ceiling center tri-corners, and the 2x4 foot traps you see near the top of the side walls would be a bit lower. Most of the panels you see here are semi-reflective on their front surface to absorb as much bass as possible, but with a controlled lesser amount of absorption at mid and high frequencies. This gives a balance of absorption versus frequency that is ideal for most rooms. It also lets you put enough bass traps in the room to truly solve the problems at low frequencies, but without killing all the mids and highs, as happens with panels made of foam or plain fiberglass. You may notice that all of these traps are not the same color. Even though I own the company, I still get stuck with product seconds and prototypes. Early reflections, sometimes called first reflections, are echoes from the side walls, floor, and ceiling that arrive at your ears soon after the direct sound from the loudspeakers. The delay is so short you don't perceive it as an echo, but having multiple versions of the same sound arrive at different times reduces clarity. Early reflections also occur off the rear wall behind you if that wall is less than about 10 feet back. The short delays also cause a particular type of skewed frequency response called comb filtering. This is a series of peaks and deep nulls whose frequencies are related to the difference in arrival times. You can determine the first reflection points either by simple math or using a mirror. These two methods are explained in depth in articles on the Realtraps website. Early reflections can be avoided using either absorption or diffusion. In smaller rooms, absorption is usually the better choice. 
Early reflections from surfaces behind you should also be avoided. Before I added this blanket, reflections from the leather couch badly skewed the high frequency response and also harmed the imaging. If I leaned back, the sound would seem to come directly from the speakers. When I leaned forward, it turned into a single large sound that is much wider and also much higher. You might think that having the speakers below the TV screen sounds unnatural. In truth, when all early reflections are avoided, you can't tell that the sound source is below the screen. Likewise, all early reflections are best avoided, which is why a dish towel is draped over this glass table. Otherwise, the delayed reflections from the table would skew imaging and create comb filtering peaks and nulls. Many people believe it's important to treat most or all of the front wall behind the speakers with absorption, but this isn't usually needed because most loudspeakers send their sound forward. Even with this large glass TV right between the speakers, very little sound from the speakers strikes the glass. As you have seen, one important goal is to create what's called a reflection-free zone. When all early reflections are avoided, the sound stage opens up to be even larger than the speaker width would imply. Instead of hearing the sound from each individual speaker, you instead hear a single large sound stage where the placement of each instrument and voice is very easy to discern. For professional recording studios, avoiding all early reflections lets the mixing engineer more easily hear small changes in panning and also discern small changes in artificial reverb that's being added. With so many bass traps, this is the flattest and tightest sounding room you will ever hear. A lot of professional recording studio owners would kill to have a control room as flat as this room. This room is so tight and clear, even using the video camera's microphone six feet away, there's very little room tone. To the uninitiated, this graph might not seem very flat, but I assure you it is compared to most rooms. In contrast, this graph shows the response and ringing that's very typical for a room the size you'll find in most homes. Even with all these traps, the bass tonality in the lowest octave still changes subtly around the room. But the change is slight, and the sound is very full and clear everywhere. It's impossible to make any room perfectly flat, but given enough bass traps and other treatment, you can transform nearly any room from terrible to truly excellent. Movies, stereo music, and concert DVDs sound simply stunning in this room. Many of my friends are professional musicians and recording engineers, and they all tell me this is one of the best rooms they've ever heard. Before we had this set up, Ellie would often complain to turn down the volume. Now, as often as not, she's the one who grabs the remote and cranks the volume. This video has shown how I approached the layout and acoustic treatment for this particular room, and explained the compromises needed. Since other rooms have different problems, if enough people request it, we'll do more videos like this in the homes of some of our other customers. Thanks for watching, and thanks to Chuck Scott for excellent camera work and encouragement.